Hello, Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight on Closing Arguments. And here on Court TV, we cover many different types of trials, many different types of murder trials. Some of them are whodunits, right? There's, there's someone is clearly murdered, but you're trying to figure out what happened, who's responsible, when did it happen? You look at all the evidence and, and, and who does it point to? Then there's a completely different kind of case that we have that isn't so much a whodunit, but what exactly happened? And what I'm talking about are cases involving firearms where people are shot and killed and we're trying to figure out is it murder or is it self-defense? And we've had a string of them here at Court TV. Uh, one of the first ones we covered when we relaunched this network was Michael Draca. Remember Michael Draca? He shot and killed Marquise McLaughlin and uh, he went to trial. He claimed self-defense. He was shoved by Marquise McLaughlin. He was on the ground, but he pulled out his, his gun and he shot and killed Marquise McLaughlin, saying he feared uh, for his life in that moment. Jury didn't agree. Michael Draca was convicted and he was sent to prison. There's another one, Curtis Reeves, very recent here on Court TV, the popcorn movie murder trial. You remember Curtis Reeves, shot and killed Chad Olson. There was an argument in the theater about cell phone use and something may have been thrown. Perhaps a cell phone was thrown at him. Then his popcorn was ripped out of his hands and thrown in his face. And before the popcorn hit the ground, Curtis Reeves shot and killed Chad Olson. He claimed self-defense and the jury said, yes, self-defense. He went home. He was found not guilty. The next day, he was walking his daughter down the aisle. Uh, then there was Theodore Edgecombe, another case that we covered here on Court TV. And he was riding his bike down the street, got into an argument with uh, Jason Clearman and his wife who were in a car. Um, then the window was rolled down. The argument continued. Theodore Edgecombe punched Jason Clearman in the face and then rode away in his bicycle. Clearman and his wife followed him. Clearman got out of the car, approached Theodore Edgecombe. Edgecombe said he feared for his life, pulled out his gun, shot and killed Jason Clearman. Jury didn't buy it. He was found guilty. Kyle Rittenhouse. This was a huge one. You remember what happened in the midst of the Kenosha riots. He shot and killed Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, also shot Gage Grosskreutz, who survived. Uh, shot three people that night, proclaimed self-defense, told his story to the jury. The jury believed it. Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty, walked out of that courthouse a free man. We've got another one for you now. And this is another big one out of South Georgia involving a... <laughs> A young man named William Marcus Wilson. There he is. He shot and killed a 17-year-old girl, Haley Hutchinson, but he's claiming he was the victim of a racial attack and he was standing his ground. Julia Janae has more. They had music playing. Um, I don't know what was going on in the back seat. Mason, he was, he was singing. Not just singing, but threatening, according to Marcus Wilson. He says he was forced to swerve out of the way to avoid colliding with Mason Glisson's truck in June of 2020. Did you see the boys drinking? A little bit. And what's a little bit? I mean, not like, not can after can after can. Macy Neagley was one of five people in Glisson's truck. Wilson told authorities he was so frightened he fired several warning shots. When we were passing all the stuff like TJ Maxx, that whole little area or whatever, and next thing I know is we're getting shot at. One of the bullets from Wilson's gun entered the pickup truck's back window and killed 17-year-old Haley Hutchinson. Wilson was charged with felony murder and aggravated assault, but his attorneys say he committed no crime, that he was asserting his right to use deadly force under Georgia's Stand Your Ground law. Georgia law says we don't have a duty to retreat, to pull over on the side of the road, to call the police, to do anything other than to stand our ground and to exercise that level of force, including deadly force, so long as you are justified in using that force. Wilson's sister, Chelsea, believes her brother was defending himself. He had a right to stand his ground. He felt like his life was threatened, um, and I 100% believe that. The defense also alleges the confrontation was racially motivated, but the teens in that truck, also key witnesses in the case, deny it. In Luke 
refer to Mary Jane as one of the loving no, no. You don't recall that after the first set of shots, you saw Luke saying or doing anything outside of the window? I don't remember, I don't think so. During that car ride on the bypass, you never heard anyone utter any racial slurs to you or to Mark, correct? Yes, ma'am. And it was Mark who told you that he heard them say something to him, correct? Yes, ma'am, they were on his side of the car. A judge presiding over the Stand Your Ground hearing denied immunity for Wilson. His fate now rests with a jury when he stands trial for murder to determine if his actions were justified. This is a big case. Big case. Stand Your Ground hearing concluded today. It was denied, so it's going to trial. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight, folks, in New York City, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernard Villalona. In Cleveland, Ohio, criminal defense attorney Ian Friedman. And in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Brian Watkins. Of course, you can contact him at brianwatkinslaw.com. Welcome to everyone. Um, I want to go quickly around your first impressions of this case. Give me like 15, 20 seconds, your initial impressions of all this. Bernardo. I see race being a huge issue in this case. I also see, I can feel the fear that this the this person had when he was driving. You got to think you're dealing with Georgia. And that truck is a big truck. If that truck was driving next to me and swerving into my lane, I will also have an issue with it. So let's see what happens. Ian? I want to see how uh, the folks in the other vehicle uh, that was, uh, the deceased was in, how they hold up under cross-examination uh, at trial. And I also want to see what the passenger, uh, the girlfriend of Mr. Wilson, says. I think she's going to be critical in this case. We've got to see all the evidence uh, here and, and not just make an early opinion based upon the stand your ground yeah. hearing. Yeah, Brian, what's your initial impression of, of this case, this scenario, two cars driving down the road? I think the defendant here is going to have to actually show why he feared for his life that he was imminent in imminent fear of suffering great bodily injury and or death. Having a road rage situation, yes, you can be scared. You never know what the other person's going to do, but fear of the unknown is not enough. Okay, Marcus Wilson did not testify in, in this hearing. He didn't testify in this Stand Your Ground hearing. He may testify at trial, may still do that. Um, so they didn't have that evidence. But what they did have was Emma Rigdon. This is the defendant's girlfriend. She was in the car. And, and the way the cars are set up, you've got, I believe, Marcus Wilson on the, on the right lane, the... The pickup truck with the other teenagers in the left lane, and I believe Emma is in the passenger seat of Marcus's car. Let's take a listen to her testimony. What happened after you got your food at Taco Bell? We were going to turn out um, to go back to my house, and that's when we saw the truck. You saw the truck? What yes, truck? The, the truck that was driving into our lane. The truck that was swerving into your lane yes, at the Taco Bell pulling out. That's the first time you saw the truck? Yes, ma'am. I believe that's when Mark made the comment or one of us made the comment that they may be drunk. And then did you at some point end up side by side with this truck? Yes, ma'am. What happened? Um, we passed that, we were passed that red light at Hobby Lobby and then the last entrance going into Hobby Lobby Right after we passed that is around the same time as they started swerving into our lane, hanging out the window. Did you hear them yelling anything? I did not hear anything. Okay. Did you see them moving their mouths? Were you able to see that they were saying something, albeit you couldn't hear it? I wasn't able to move. Okay. It was dark. What happens next? Um, they were swerving our lane. Um, it was kind of a little bit of that. We were kind of going on the side. When you um, say going on the side, did you hear something that made you know the little going on? Zzz, zzz. Okay. I don't okay. know exactly what they're called. Um, and let me ask you, were you doing that to avoid the truck? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did Mark ever communicate with these people? Um, yes, ma'am. I believe he was just kind of like rolled down the window was like, hey, chill, stop. And they're like, we don't want any problems. We just want to do a good talk about and go home. And did they stop? Mm -hmm. What happened? Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, that that's when Mark shot to kind of say, hey, you know, stop. Um, they slowed down. They came 
brought back a bus at us. And then we heard a loud noise. We didn't know what it was. You heard a loud noise? Where? where? It sounded like they may have thrown something and hit the vehicle. Um, I don't know what they threw. I don't know if there was anything. I don't know. Um, and then that's when Mark shot again, when they came back up on us. Do you recall telling somebody after this happened that Mark got mad and pulled a gun and started shooting? I do not recall saying those exact words, just like that. You didn't ask Mark to pull a gun and start shooting, did you? No, ma'am. All right. In fact, when Mark pulled his gun, you told law enforcement that you told him not to shoot. I don't know if I recall saying that. I remember saying no. I was scared. It's a very scary situation. But I don't recall saying don't shoot. I and pulling a gun made you scared and fear for your life, correct? No, I was already scared. I have someone swerving into my lane. All right. I want to start with you, Ian. You wanted to hear some of the evidence. I just gave you some of the evidence. What do you think? Yeah, I think that, you know, I'm not surprised that she doesn't remember everything uh, in the heat of everything going on and her being terrified. It's clearly going to need the defendant to have to put forth uh, some greater evidence as what he perceived. The two people being in the car together does not necessarily mean that they're going to be hearing, seeing, feeling, and perceiving the same. So he's going to have to get there. But she said some things that were important. The car was coming at them. The car was coming over into their lane. She thought something did, in fact, uh, come over. It made a loud noise, may have hit the car. And that seems to be consistent with some of the earlier statements he made. So I think now he's going to have to fill in the rest of the story and tell those jurors what he felt at that moment. And whether or not the question is going to be, did he reasonably fear for his safety or that of his passenger? And we've all represented people who have been charged with uh, trying to hurt people with their vehicles, where it's been perceived as or classified as a deadly weapon. So the question's going to be, was he reasonable? Did they do that? End of story. And it's really just going to come from, uh, from his mind out through his mouth. Brian Watkins, are you hearing enough yet for the use of deadly force? Absolutely not. She was a terrible witness. You know, when she says, I don't remember saying it exactly like that. Those are terrible answers. And Ian, I got to disagree with you. You can't just fear for your safety. You have to fear that you are going to suffer imminent bodily, great bodily injury, not just injury, great bodily injury and or death to use deadly force. Think of every road rage situation. People are hanging out of the window, swerving into your lane, throwing sodas, throwing things out of the window. That does not call for deadly force. And the problem with the stand okay. your ground law is, is that yeah, you have the right to stand your ground, but when you do stand your ground and you don't retreat and do something like a reasonable person or somebody, a juror would say, well, I would kind of just slow down and let this guy pass or something like that. When you don't do evasive action, it goes to show whether or not you are actually in fear or whether it was anger or something else. And that's, I think, is going to be the problem here. You know, he could have slowed his vehicle down. Yeah, he didn't have to. But if you're in fear of being in cra but crashing and dying, most people would slow their vehicle down first. So it's going to be a tough case for the defendant. Bernarda, I don't what, know. what do you think of this? I, I, go ahead, Ian. Get, get the response in there, yeah. and then I got one for Bernarda. <laughs> yeah, just very quickly. I think each case has to be taken on its own particular circumstance, obviously. But I would submit that a car coming at a person under a particular circumstance can easily be perceived as a threat of deadly harm. So I hear what you're saying, Brian, in particular cases. But this one's got to be looked at on its own uh, because we all know uh, that people can fear if a car is coming at them closely, it's pretty reasonable to think that they're in uh, harm's way and, and, in fact, it is imminent. So I hear what you're saying. Let's see what this case says. Bernardo, one key fact that the judge cited in denying the stand your ground, Haley Hutchinson was shot in the back of the head. Yeah. We, saw, we saw she's sitting in the back and she's shot in the back of the head. Um, that means that the pickup is in front of Marcus Wilson's car, and the judge found that to be a fact that did not help the defense, that was telling a little bit of a different story at that moment. Your thoughts? I agree, but I, what I want to know is whether at the time when he fired that shot, whether the car was swerving that would have caused the vehicle to be more in a frontal position or in the position as to the passenger of that vehicle. So that's what I would need to know because if it's dead head on, 
you got to think, was the person far ahead of you in order to make that contact shot? Or was it that the car, that big truck was cutting in front of Marcus Wilson's vehicle? Because that makes a huge difference. But in regards in general, deadly weapon is a vehicle. Let's remember that Sean Bell was killed by police officers because the police officers allege because Sean Bell was driving towards them that they feared, had imminent fear of imminent serious physical injury or death.